we'll just um, allow people a few minutes to to um, to join because lots of people are joining. Um, so we'll just give it another minute or two. Okay, um, maybe let's uh, start and um, I'm just wanted to introduce myself and welcome you. My name is Di McIntyre and I'm from the IHEA management team uh, and I'm helping manage the webinar today. So I'm here really for technical issues rather than to provide any content. Um, but welcome and, and thank you for registering for this webinar today on role preferences in medical decision making. Uh, the webinar will, will run for approximately 90 minutes and it is going to be recorded. It is already being recorded and it will be uploaded on the IHEA website uh, within the next day or so. So if you know people who would have liked to have attended and were unable to, you can direct them to the website. So just one or two um, housekeeping things. If you experience any technical problems and want some assistance during the webinar, if you can just in the chat box, send me a direct message and I will try to assist you. Um, also, we have set everyone's um, microphones to uh, mute, and that's really just to try to reduce the background noise. Um, so if you could keep your microphones muted when you're not uh, speaking, if you, we would really encourage you to start posing questions or um, anything like that, please just use the uh, chat box as well, but um, indicate that it's for everyone. I'm going to fade into the background now and hand over to Fern, uh, who is one of the uh, conveners of the Health Preference Special Interest Group that organized this webinar. So over to Fern. Thank you, Di. Um, I hope everyone can hear clearly. So um, welcome everyone to our uh, first webinar of 2022, uh, Role Preferences in Medical Decision Making. We're really happy to be hosting this seminar that is um, somewhat joint with the International Academy of Health Preference Research um, and has uh, been organized by many active members there and we're very happy to be linking them over to IHEA and for all of you for, for joining. Um, so today's seminar will be around something that we all uh, think about, I think, or, or experience is how much do we want to be actively involved in, the, in our medical decisions um, and how much do our providers want us to be involved in our medical decisions. Um, and so we have three um, presenters um, from around the globe. Um, I'm going to start off if each of the presenters can briefly introduce yourselves, um, where you're based, and um, start off with your. So each of the, the uh, our presenters is going to give us a framework for analyzing role preferences. And um, we'll have half an hour discussion at the end. Ben, uh, ben Craig is also here, uh, the executive director of the IAHPR, who will be moderating this discussion towards the end. Do indeed feel free to um, use the chat. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand it over to you, Alison. Introduce yourself and then um, enjoy. Thank you. Hi, uh, Fern, can I just confirm, do you just want me to introduce myself or I think um, 
Yeah, okay, so my name's Alison Pierce. I am a health economist uh, in the Sydney School of Public Health at the University of Sydney. Um, and most of my research focuses on the economics of cancer, um, and I also have a strong interest in health preferences research and discrete choice experiments more specifically. I thought you could just start with your presentation, but Samar, please introduce yourself and Janine, and then we'll start with, with your presentation, Alison. Go ahead, Samar. Sure. Hi, my name is Semra Özdemir. Um, I'm based in, in um, Singapore at Duke US Medical School. I'm affiliated with Signature Program in Health Services and Systems Research Pro Program, as well as the Center for Palliative Care. Um, and my research area is medical decision making and within medical decision making, I focus on three areas. One of them is health preference assessment, like discrete choice experiments. The second was understand, second one is understanding the decision making process between clinicians, patients and, um, and caregivers. And the third one is uh, the, on developing and testing interventions to help patients make informed decisions such as um, decision aids. Hi, uh, my name is Janine van Til. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Uh, I have uh, more than 15 years of experience in uh, health preference research. I started with my PhD in health preference research. I've uh, done uh, some work in uh, exploring societal preferences, but in the last year have focused on uh, the use of uh, health preference methods to elicit individual patient preferences, um, to understand patient preferences, but also to support the actual clinical decision-making process. I think uh, the idea of Fern was that I would start with the presentation. So if you're okay with that, I will take uh, the lead. Just uh, to inform our audience, we have been um, developing these presentations individually. So we have each developed our individual frame framework. And just like you are, we're very curious to learn about each other's work and how our thoughts and ideas about these topics uh, overlap. So with that, I would like to um, go to my first slide um, and a bit about the background. Uh, as I see it for this work, I think most of us are familiar with health references uh, research. And um, within the microeconomic theory, these preferences are elicited from respondents to estimate demand curves for goods. And in healthcare, we use that to estimate preferences for health related goods. Um, with these utilities and in combination with classical decision theory, we assume that by assigning these quantitative utilities to options, we can facilitate rational choices between alternatives and help people make better decisions. Um, when we look at the role of patients within microeconomic theory, uh, this is most in line with, uh, with a liberal and individualistic concept of autonomy of who should make a decision. When we look at the other hand at the, the need for shared decision making in clinical practice, this is argued uh, based on the right for self-determination and autonomy of patients. And in most clinical settings, uh, we argue that a collaborative process between patients and clinician is seen as the most desired way of making decisions. And for patients and uh, clinicians to engage in such a collaborative process. Of course, the patient must be informed about their alternatives, but also clinicians must understand patient values and treatment preferences. And that is often how we argue the role of health preference research within clinical decision-making. Uh, when we look at examples in the literature on health preference research, um, we often find examples of uh, preferences elicited in decisions that are single event, high risk decisions, where it's not clear what the best option is, and but uh, in which there are few mutually exclusive options which patients can choose from. And um, that there is a role of health preference research in, in clinical decision making uh, can be supported by the fact that um, the use of health preference methods 
with stronger theor theoretical underpinnings than currently is the case is recommended uh, in, uh, to be used as value clarification methods in patient decision aids. On the other hand, in many, cl many clinical situations, decisions do not occur at the point of selecting a treatment, but rather develop over time, are based uh, on the experience of the patients in interaction with clinicians, but also friends and family members. And it is said that there are many, many other factors such as emotion, the context of the decision, and the opinions of others that influence that decision. So the question really is how do we as as group us as health preference researchers deal with the fact that if we collect preferences from uh, patients um, to support clinical decision making, uh, we often elicit, elicit them from individuals at one moment in time, while these clinical decisions are actually made based on preferences of multiple stakeholders, including relatives, other caretakers, clinicians within their whole social network. And the aim of my presentation, but also of uh, the presentations that follow, uh, is to present a framework that helps us understand the relevance of health preference research, or actually how health preference research should deal with preferences that include multiple stakeholder preferences for treatment and different role preferences. Just to make uh, clear that there is a distinction or we're actually talking or I'm actually talking about two different kinds of preferences. Uh, I would like to dis distinguish treatment preferences, which are often defined as the comparison and balancing of pros and cons of options. Um, uh, with the aim to raise the issue of the relevance of these outcomes to the patient and contrast them with decisional role preferences, um, which is about the role that the patient wants to take in the clinical decision. So these are two separate things that both have a role in my framework. When we talk about role preferences, um, the, well, the most often used instrument to measure role preferences is the control preference scale, which is developed by Deckner and Sloan. And it divides role preferences into five categories, ranging from a passive role, where the patient prefers to leave all decisions regarding treatment uh, to the doctor, to a very active patient's role where patients make, make their own decisions about treatment they will receive. As I said, the current paradigm in clinical decision making is the collaborative role in which doctors and patients share responsibility for deciding which treatment is best for them. And it, there's ample evidence that uh, most patients also prefer prefer to share the decision with physicians. But at the same time, uh, there's also evidence that, uh, for instance, a systematic review by Harrison and others concluded that um, concordant preferences, uh, in, their, in their study, concordant preferences were only found between patients and physicians in four out of the 38 studies they reviewed. And all the other studies either had uh, disconcordant preferences between doctors uh, and patients or partly disconcordant and concordant preferences. Um, and in my search for a framework, I also, of course, looked at other frameworks. And um, I have uh, found this framework by uh, Gomez. Uh, Firseda, um, which um, argues this individual, individual role of uh, the patient as it's stated in microeconomic theory. Um, because in this article, uh, they propose a relational account of autonomy in which the patient is situated in the center. And this patient directly interacts uh, with the healthcare team but also with its uh, the, uh, or his or her relational environment, which consists of family, uh, friends, or even the wider community. Uh, and there's also an interaction between healthcare professionals and the relational environment. So family interacts with the doctor and this will affect the patient. Um, I think this example of the relational account uh, 
of um, autonomy. It addresses the complexity of real life interactions and it acknowledges that autonomy is embedded in, in a wider context. So um, this is a challenge uh, when we relate this to the concept of uh, autonomy as we think of it in health preference research. And the fact that family can play an important part in decision-making is also empirically supported. Uh, for instance, by the study of Ledger Powell et al. Uh, uh, in 2016. Uh, and they have done a, a large qualitative study uh, exploring the role of uh, family involvement in cancer treatment decision-making. And first of all, their findings suggest that uh, different roles, actions, and involvement of family members uh, happens at different stages of the decision. Second, they find that different attitudes among patients, clinicians, and family members towards that family involvement in the decision-making process. Uh, and they, uh, like in the role preference scale, which we saw for patients, these authors distinguish four potential roles of family members in the decision stake, stage. Uh, which range from no family involvement at all, uh, family involvement through proximal actions where family members support the patient, help the patient find and understand important information and support the decision that the patients make. Uh, there's a shared family influence where patients and family members uh, have a joint role and family members also share their own preferences about what is the best treatment for the patient. And finally, there can be a controlling family influence where the family members take the lead and actually have more influence on the decision than the patient themselves. These authors also identify many factors that influence the degree of family involvement, uh, which include patient factors, family factors, cultural factors, relationship factors, and the characteristics of the decision itself. So, for a framework to work for health preference re re research next to the patients, the clinician, the family, and the close relationship of the patient, uh, we also need to add treatment preferences to the framework which we saw earlier. And this is my first uh, presentation of my suggested framework, where the patient and the clinician are in the middle, both have their own preferences regard to the role of the patient in the decision. Both have their own treatment preferences uh, demonstrated by the arrows that go from the clinician and the patient to treatment and role preferences. And these view influence the decision-making process and the extent to which uh, the decision is based on treatment preference of the patient, treatment preferences of the, of the clinician or both, but we also include family and close relationship, which again, each can have their own role preference, but they're also their own treatment preference. Patients and clinician characteristics as seen in the, uh, well, the first um, circle around this framework uh, influence treatment preferences and uh, role preferences. That is also supported by literature, literature. Family tends to be more involved in patients are younger or older, if they're physically or mentally uh, unwell, or if they felt they had to advocate for patients if patients do not do this themselves. Um, we also know uh, that patient characteristics such as age and gender influence their preferred role preferences with older people and women preferring more passive roles. Um, and patient and clinician factors just as age, gender, ethnicity, but also personality characteristics like having internal or external locus of control, thinking style and psychological needs like competence, autonomy and relatedness influence uh, both can influence both role preferences and uh, treatment preferences. 
when we look at the, uh, I think it's just the, the second circle, we, and related to the decision factors, uh, the study of um, Latcher Powell also explored this and, and uh, found that um, family tends to be more involved uh, in big complex decisions with long-term consequences as contrasted with small simple decisions which can, can be easily reconsidered. And uh, family is more involved when the decisions that are made directly impact family members because they are, for instance, caregivers to children, caregivers to the patients themselves, or when decisions by the patients influence the future of their family, for instance, regarding decisions regarding fertility and sexuality. Um, there's also an influence of disease factors that influence family involvement. Uh, there's a more involved role of family members in vulnerable patient populations. Um, and there's growing evidence of the role of caregivers, family in other diseases, such as cancer treatment. Um, but also patient role preferences de de depend on the type of disease. There's ample evidence that uh, patients take a more active role in cancer treatments and in decisions regarding invasive procedures than, for instance, uh, in chronic uh, conditions um, where uh, a more passive role is sometimes uh, taken. And finally, um, there are external factors that influence role preferences and family involvement, but might also influence treatment preferences. Um, I found a study that, uh, that indicated that country of origin can influence role preferences with people from Canada having more passive role preferences than those from the US. Um, but I also identified uh, uh, a study that looked at cultural factors that influence family involvement for instance, due to influence of cultural, cultural norms on autonomy, autonomy, but also related to um, uh, language barriers when talking about uh, treatments made, for instance, by immigrants, where family members have a larger role simply because the patient themselves might not uh, fully understand the clinician and they need help understanding medical information. So my final framework looks like this. Um, the straight arrows here indicate that both patients and the clinicians have role preferences and treatment preferences. Uh, and both patient and clinicians role preferences uh, are influenced by patient characteristics. Uh, while clinician role preferences can also be influenced by clinician characteristics. The circles represent the different factors that influence the decision-making process, such as uh, family and close relationship, decision characteristics, disease characteristics, and the external environment. And the dotted arrows represent that there's a possible influence of all these factors, family, decision, disease, and environment, on both role preferences and treatment preferences. Family and close relationship also can have their own treatment preferences and role preferences, which influence the decision-making process. And finally, we could ask ourselves whether and how role preferences would interact with the treatment preferences we elicit ourselves. So whether there's an interaction and whether we measure different preferences from somebody with active role preferences than from somebody with passive role preferences to take the extremes. This was my framework, and I'm very curious to hear, hear about what Samra and Alison think about this. So I would like to uh, give the word to Samra. Thank you, Janine. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Okay. 
um, can you my can you see my screen now as a slideshow? Oh, perfect. Okay. So yeah, as we mentioned, uh, you know, earlier in the at the beginning of the presentation, we worked on our frameworks independently, and um, you're going to see that we have very different approaches. So I kind of have a very different approach to um, to the framework. Uh, uh, on decision making roles. Um, so I just wanted to start with the context, like um, mostly we, we are talking about shared decision making here, but of course, uh, some of our discussions um, may relate to other types of decision making styles as well um, in, in healthcare. And historically, we have seen mostly, you know, paternalistic decision making um, being the common decision making styles and which move towards shared decision making. And the Asian maybe uh, side of the world is following a little bit behind this and paternalistic decision making still is, uh, is quite common. And then on the other spectrum, we have the informed decision making where the patient role and responsibility is much higher and, and clinicians play a, you know, much like hands off um, role. But mainly my discussion is like Jennings is going to be around the, um, the shared decision making and decisions related to preference sensitive, you know, preference sensitive decisions, because for some decisions, it's kind of clear, we don't have to go through all this discussion, you just got to use drug A, that's it. But there are lots of preference sensitive um, decisions that, uh, in the clinical setting, and those are the ones actually, you know, um, we are really discussing in this panel. Uh, in this panel, and I'm going to really focus on that specifically later in my discussion. So I wanted to, you know, I start thinking about first, okay, who are the, let's start thinking about who are the stakeholders in decision making, like we, who are we talking about? And again, traditionally, the, the, the literature researchers, we all focused on the relationship, this dietic relationship between clinicians and patients, and, um, you know, who is the more dominant one, who's the more active one, how much patients are involved, how much they would like to involve, um, do they trust their clinician? Uh, um, so the focus was on this, really on this diet. However, um, luckily, in more recent years, we start giving more attention to caregivers. And when I say caregivers, I mean the family, friends, loved ones of the patient. And again, traditionally, caregivers were studied more in like uh, and, um, pedi for pediatric patients where the parents make decisions for their kids or um, you know, surrogate this in the surrogate decision making context. Surrogates are making decisions for the they are uh, the patients who cannot make decisions for themselves. But here, I really want to focus on all the other kind of decision making where patients are also you know they, they're coherent, they are cognitively able, but um, caregivers are still part of the decision making uh, process. And I must say that and admit for I, I should be the first one to admit that I really started thinking about caregivers after moving to Singapore and seeing the kind of decision-making process in Singapore and how much caregivers are involved in the decision-making process, way more than that I have ever ob observed in other parts of the world. Um, so in that sense, I really like when, uh, like Jenny and I looked at the literature as, as well, what's been done, and I really like the, the model developed by um, Letzer and Powell and uh, in 2017 published in Patient Education and Counseling, and Janine actually um, talked about several of their other papers uh, focusing on family involvement. And they also have a framework talking about this periodic relationship between the patients, caregivers, and the clinicians. And then and according to their framework, you know, there are different ways of uh, decision-making styles. Um, you know, it can be led by clinicians or patients or caregivers, as well as you can see that uh, more shared kind of decision-making between two of the stakeholders, or it can be really a shared decision making among all the stakeholders. And, uh, you know, I have this caregiver as like, as if it's one person, but it gets really complicated, because caregiver is not just one person, usually it can be multiple people, right? Friends, family, multiple people in the family. So in that sense, it can get really complicated. And, um, and this is, at least from my experience and from what I have seen in the literature, this is especially the case for um, chronic, chronic disease management, uh, especially for serious you know, chronic disease, as well as end of life decision making, because that's where you know, emotionally there's so much in stake um, that caregivers and then you know, patient 
uh, caregivers has to deal with the bereavement and all that regret or guilt or whatever decision has been made. So caregivers are really a part of this end of life decision making uh, as well. So, okay, um, then I start thinking about, you know, what are the different stages of shared de uh, decision making process? What are we like, what, what, how does this happen in the clinical sector? And I was trying to put, you know, from my researcher, um, um, you know, I try to put the clinician head, like kind of try to see uh, the clinical setting um, in terms of what's happening um, e throughout the decision making process. And it's very simply, I see like four stages. One of them is the, the first one is the information exchange. And when you look at the different roles, the patients and caregivers, I kind of lump patients and caregivers. So I, you know, up till now, I kind of criticize the literature not paying too much attention to caregivers. And now I'm lumping caregivers with the patients because we don't really have too much time to get into too many specifics, but I think caregiver's role is similar to patients and much more to kind of support the patient to make that decision making. Um, um, of course, sometimes they're consistent with the, their preferences, consistent with the patient, sometimes not. So that's a whole different, um, um, you know, uh, uh, discussion we can have. But uh, mainly, so let's look at patient side versus the clinician expert side, you know. And in that sense, uh, for information, exchanging information, uh, patient knows themselves most, right? They know that their symptoms, they know their health history, personal history, and they need to communicate, you know, communicating that uh, to the clinician. So that's the ex exchange of information from their part. And from the clinician part, they listen to the patient, they identify the problem, right? What is wrong? What's, you know, what's, what's wrong with the patient? What's the diagnosis? And then they list, they give the options of care, whether it's, involves testing, medications, treatment. So they talk about what are the pros and cons. And the second role, maybe this is more of the focus of this uh, panel discussion, is the defining the roles um, different stakeholders are going to take. And from the patient caregiver perspective, okay, what, how much do I want to involve in this decision making? Of course, by making that kind of, you know, even thinking about preferences for involvement, we are assuming that the patient understands, the patient understands the decision context, they understand uh, uh, what kind of options they have, and then they understand that actually they have a right to say what they want. So all these things are assumptions we are making until they can say, okay, I'm going to involve this much, or I'm not going to involve that much. And that also involves how much they, you know, includes how much they trust in the clinician. And then from the clinician perspective, um, it's, you know, they kind of look at the, um, how much patient or the caregiver understands uh, the the information provided, and then they identify the stakeholders. Uh, I think this is a very, you know, like um, it's a big burden. It's a big job for the clinician to be able to do something, you know, kind of, okay, who understands me, who can process information and um, who are the stakeholders. This is something I hear a lot from the clinicians in Singapore because they have to deal with Pay, uh, family members a lot and then which family member you know some um so this is something again it's uh, they have to kind of figure out the dynamics within the family and within the clinic uh in that decision making context and third, we have the deliberation and processing from the patient pers and caregiver perspective, processing the information and then assessing the values and preferences. Of course, here we're going back to our own original research area, you know, what are the preferences for different care options, treatment options. Um, and then here we have a um, clinical role, you know, the, from the clinician perspective, it's the, you know, encouraging questions, answering questions, providing support, and then assessing, like trying to understand, okay, what does the patient want? What they what do they what their family wants again i think um, we're expecting a lot from clinicians um because i you know from as a researcher it's for, so easy for me to say oh it should be shared decision making we should do this and we should listen to the patient and within the limited amount of time clinicians have we're expecting i feel i feel Feel that very strong that we're expecting a lot from them. It's um, it's not wrong to have this expectation, but we need to provide tools for them uh, to be able to do all this, uh, facilitate all this, and then finally making a you know final decision. And then this may in involve some kind of negotiation. And then again, patients may involve in the decision making process, but do they really make the final decision? And then of course, there's the review of the decision. You know, is this the right decision for me? Am I on the right track? And then, you know, that there's this follow-up process as well. 
So this is kind of very fast track of like different stages and the kind of um, uh, involvement from the patient perspective and from the uh, clinician perspective. Okay, now let's look at again, um, we talked about I talked about the four different stages. So what are the kind of preferences we can talk about in these four different stages? So from the information exchange, um, you know, there's preferences for, for patients and or the family to how much they are you know, willing to share, uh, they prefer to share their health history, share their personal information. This seems, this seems like, you know, duh, of course you should share, but that doesn't always happen, right? Um, and they need to have this feel that safe environment and trust in the clinical setting to be able to express themselves and tell about themselves to the clinicians. And then in terms of defining roles, and I think this is the part, the, the really focus of this pa uh, panel discussion perhaps is how much, you know, patients are uh, want to prefer for to um, involve in the decision making uh, process and how much they want, you know, their family members to involve, how much they, how much, uh, what kind of dominant role or what kind of role they uh, they want their clinicians to play. And then in terms of deliberation, this is the part, um, you know, some of these questions may not be directly related to preferences, but to be able to have preferences, patients need to feel that they have uh, capability to do that. They should, you know, they should feel that they can do it. They should uh, believe that you know, they're capable of making decisions. They have a right to make these decisions. So all these things, again, affect preferences. And then at the end, okay, what kind of care they want? This is where we go back to the health preference assessment, you know, benefit risk assessments and or cost, like what are their preferences for different kinds of treatments and uh, treatment features. And lastly, make, when uh, it comes to making final choice, you know, um, patients may involve in the until now, but do they want to be the one making the final decision, especially if there is some kind of contradiction between the family or with, with, the, with the clinician? And then, of course, afterwards, uh, are they satisfied with this? Because that can also influence their preferences for future uh, clinical decisions or medical decisions. Okay, so I told you know uh, after talking about different uh, stages, I should you know I, I wanted to kind of briefly uh, summarize the literature in these different areas, and as 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 far as I am aware of the literature, and um, what I have seen is that preferences for involvement in, in, in decision making is variable among different stages of the decision making process, and what we are seeing that patients are more willing to share information or involve in the discussions, but when it comes to making final decisions, maybe they are less so willing to take the lead. So this is general um, kind of on average what we are seeing from the from the literature. And then preferences for involvement is variable among different types of decisions. And this is something Janine also mentioned, right? Whether it is end of life care kind of decision or, or um, this decisions um, related to chronic care or one-time decisions like, you know, genetic testing or some kind of other mammography testing. So uh, preferences change, you know, preference for involvement change depending on what kind of uh, decision it is. And then preferences for involvement in decision making, is it variable throughout the illness trajectory? Um, I'm asking this more of a question because I think this is one of the areas that's been studied the least. There's hardly, a, like I have seen only a few studies um, and they only follow the patients in a very short period of time. And I can imagine that um, throughout the illness trajectory, when you think about the chronic illness management, people's involvement in decision making may change based on your, you know, their comfort, their knowledge as their uh, knowledge about the disease increase, they may be more involved. Whereas, uh, on the other hand, as they get sicker and sicker, they may not feel that kind of, you know, capability to be able to make decisions, and they may rely on more on their families or clinicians. Uh, however, having said that, um, I have. I've been doing some research on this actually. I've been looking at data. I, we have followed uh, cancer patients as well as heart failure patients for three years now. We just got the data, we're working on it. And my preliminary findings, findings show that uh, role preferences are pretty stable, but this is still very preliminary, so we'll see. But I'm very curious to see more research in this area. And then this is something Janine also mentioned, preferences for involvement variable across, you know, changes across culture 
cultures and we're definitely seeing a trend towards Asian cultures being uh, less uh, active or prefer to be less active. Or, and then um, preference for involvement in decision making is variable, again, depend on different groups, you know, personal characteristics like education, uh, gen uh, education, gender, age, make a difference even if they are within the same culture. And one of the things I'm consist consistently finding within Asia, and I can imagine this is true in other countries too, is that minorities, like Janine mentioned in terms of linguistic differences between the patient and the physician, but even if they speak the same, same language, we can, we, we're also observing minorities um, be, uh, involving less, their preferences uh, for involvement is um, quite different than uh, non-minorities. And then uh, preferences for involvement or dependable on the involvement of other stakeholders. This is something also Janine mentioned, you know, how much as a person I can rely on my, depend on my family, how much I trust that they can represent my opinions, my beliefs, my values. So these are the things also, uh, there's quite a bit of research on this as well. And most of this research actually comes from end of life decision making, because I think uh, that's when we are, re um, there's more research done in terms of caregiver involvement, not only surrogate decision making, but in general caregiver involvement. Uh, so we're seeing quite a bit literature on this um, in end of life decision making. Okay, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to go really quickly. So in terms of, so so as I mentioned earlier, like um, that we're, we're putting too much, uh, you know, expecting a lot from the clinicians. Um, maybe we have a right to expect that kind of clinical setting, but maybe it's not always the clinicians that have to go through, you know, that have to do that. So that's why a lot of, you know, preference researchers now working on decision aids, and there's other researchers coming from other disciplines working on decision aids. And I really believe that decision aids have a role and they can really help facilitating shared decision making in, um, in different stages of the decision making process, for example, in terms of providing information, of course, but also in terms of helping patients understand what kind of role they want to play in. And maybe as far as empowering the patients, perhaps to, to involve in decision making. And of course, with um, values clarification, uh, methods we're also assessing uh, preferences uh, but on uh, I think decision aids fall really short in terms of like making the final decision what's the final decision making and how can we influence that or not influence in a way that we want uh, in a certain way it's just that it's so that it's consistent with the patient preferences so decision aids make a, I think can help until up till now ideally or theoretically they can but when it's about making the final decision I think um uh, they really, um, ha I haven't seen much research on that on decision aids. Um, okay, I'm going to skip this. This is uh, the type of questions I use to assess role preferences. Perhaps we can talk about this later. So just to kind of as a recommendation for future research, I didn't really get into what kind of tools are available out there, but I don't. I think most of the tools. Um, uh, at least the ones I'm aware of, they don't do a good job in terms of assessing preferences in different stages of the decision making process. Um, and they're not relevant in different cultures, especially um, for Asian cultures or more Eastern cultures. I think um, the, the focus is mostly like at this when I did my search to look at, they all focus on the clinician and patient uh, diets. Um, or they look at the patient uh, family diet separately, but they don't look at at the same time, like what happens uh, between three. Uh, so I think there, there's definitely room to develop tools uh, to help it assess uh, preferences and then assess preferences for the different stages of the decision making. And I couldn't help myself as a you know health preference uh, res uh, re researcher, um, I think as um, you know, we have kind of uh, we owe to the field. I feel like we owe to the field to develop methods to elicit preferences at the individual level, um, and that can be used in a clinical setting. I think we um, we did not do a very good job with that, and I must say the field is um, 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 is like um, full of people from different disciplines. And I feel like we have to <laughs> kind of um, show our, um, like as a as health preference assessment researchers, we, we um, have done a lot. We use, you know, all these methods to assess uh, preferences for medications, treatments, and we can really uh, 
at the population level, at the sample level, or at the group level, but we can really um, uh, do a better job at helping real clinical decision making by developing tools to, to assess preferences at the individual level. So we, this is yeah something I think we all to the field. Um, so yeah, that's all my that's all I have. And Alison, I'm also really excited to hear your opinion. Thank you. Thanks, Samra. That's um that was super interesting, and um, I can't decide whether I'm delighted that there's been a bit of overlap between the two previous presentations and what I was going to talk about, or whether. Um, I'm disappointed, but anyway, I'll, I'll take you through what I've prepared and then I'm really looking forward to the discussion at the end. So can you see my presentation okay? Yeah, great. Um, so I guess just by way of introduction, um, one of the reasons why I'm so interested in this topic is because one of the very first DCEs I did was in prostate cancer survivors, so predominantly a population of older men. And it was in a healthcare setting that still had a fairly traditional, strong model of clinician directed care. And despite multiple rounds of pre testing, and we did cognitive interviews and focus groups and tried all sorts of variations of our DCE survey, we ended up deciding that we couldn't run it because the participants just had such a strong preference for clinicians making decisions about their care that we couldn't get them to trade off between, we were looking at aspects of follow-up care, how they wanted their follow-up care provided. Um, they basically all said they would either drop out of the survey because they couldn't understand they were being asked to do it, or they effectively used some heuristic, like always choosing the opt-out, um, again, because they, they couldn't really understand why we were asking them to make this decision, which clearly their doctor should be making for them. So um, ever since then, I've had a really strong interest in how um, this idea of role preferences can influence the health preferences research that, um, that I do. So um, this is my single unifying graphic that we were asked to present. Um, basically, it shows that I think patient role preferences are on a distribution, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So I've shown that here on the bell curve, and that these preferences are really interesting uh, influenced by a range of different factors. So we've got things like patient characteristics on the left, the decision-making activity in yellow at the top, other people and the clinical context. And I think each of these has really been touched on um, by both Janine and Semra, um, but I'll, I'll briefly describe each of the elements uh, that I was thinking of when I talked about these. And then um, I think what's interesting is to also think about how this kind of concept of role preferences might impact on our health preferences research. So I've just got a slide on that at the end. So I won't go through the definitions because we've had some definitions of what role preferences are. And in fact, I was going to say that I've really used um, the Degner and Sloan kind of um, idea of preferences being on a continuum um, in my thinking as well. So everything from I prefer to make my own decisions to um, I prefer to leave all the decisions to my doctor and then kind of shared or um, semi-shared in between those. Um, and so when we think about role preferences being on this kind of continuum, the variation that I'm trying to present with my bell curve um, represents the variation of role preferences between individuals and subgroups. And I think we've seen some really nice examples, you know, older people tend to have a preference for clinicians to make the decision for them. Um, Samra was just talking about different cultural groups who might have different preferences for how um, independent they are in their decision making role. Um, but I think also that bell curve could represent the distribution of different role preferences that an individual can have. So for some medical decisions that an individual might have a very strong view and be want to be very independent in their um, decision making but for other health problems that same individual might prefer for the doctor to lead um, in the decision making so within an individual they might have a sort of distribution of their role preferences and I use the bell curve just because that's the one that was available in PowerPoint I think it's probably a slightly more skewed bell curve we know that most people prefer uh, in a lot of contexts to have the doctor having more of a say um, so it's probably a slightly skewed curve. Um, the other thing to note is just that we know that when healthcare decisions are made in a way that's consistent with the preferences people have for the way the choice is made, 
then there's lots of benefits like um, improved satisfaction and potentially improved uh, adherence and outcomes and even reduced costs. So that's the center of my diagram, which shows this kind of idea of there being a distribution of patient role preferences. And I'll just go through each of the boxes around the outside. Now, I think each of these really just describe the different factors that can influence the role preferences. So the first is patient factors, and we've heard a bit about these already. Um, so we know there's variation in sort of how active people want to be in their medical decisions. And some of this is explained by sociodemographics, so things like age or gender and personality, uh, coping style. Um, one of the patient factors, which I think was a real driver of the difficulty that I had with my own DCE, and maybe um, Janine, I think you might have touched on this as well, but was the idea that patients need to understand that they can have a role in decision making and what that role can look like, and also be really aware that um, medical decisions aren't always just based on medical fact, you know, that they can be value based um, or have some component of value judgment within them. And I think a lot of the patients that I was interviewing in that early DCE didn't really feel like they were entitled to have a role in decision making. And so they couldn't understand why we were asking them to make this choice. And so I think that's something which perhaps gets missed in some of our, um, in some of our work. The other thing which is perhaps a bit different um, to some of the other ways of thinking about patient factors is to take more of this kind of theoretical approach. And I really liked this paper from um, Ken Resnikow and colleagues in the US, which came out last year, um, which used self-determination theory to look at sort of motivation um, and people's preferences for shared care. And so this is a theory that suggests people need to feel um, competent and supported and autonomous in order to make choices that will really reflect their needs and their preferences and their values. Um, and the thing I really liked in this paper was that it sort of expanded on the idea that that can actually include someone autonomously deciding to defer the decision-making to their doctor. So just because it might be doctor-led decision-making doesn't mean it's not um, shared care or patient-centered care. Uh, if the patient has autonomously chosen for um, the doctor to either share in the decision making or take over the decision making. The other um, theory that Resnikar puts forward in this paper, which um, struck a chord with me, was this kind of difficulty motivation matrix. And um, the main thing that struck me was the idea that if a patient perceives a choice as being too difficult, whether that's because there's some medical information or terminology that they haven't understood, or whether they're overwhelmed by other factors such as you know, recently being given a cancer diagnosis, then they might be less motivated to take an active role in decision making. And I think this is something that um, can certainly influence people's role preferences, but also their healthcare preferences and how they might fill in a, um, a patient preference survey. So we've heard a little bit from the others about other people and how they can influence um, people's role preferences. So obviously there's the clinician um, and I think Janine really nicely sort of described this as a shared, the other half of the shared decision maker, but also as an individual who might bring their own preferences to the choice. I did also want to point out that I think we've had quite a bit of discussion about how the patient isn't just the patient, they also have this family and friends and other loved ones who might be involved in the decision. I think the clinician probably isn't always just a single clinician, often, you know, particularly in the context of cancer where I do my, most of my work, it can be a multidisciplinary team. Um, and so there's probably in lots of cases more than one individual there. I also just wanted to flag that there's probably, you know, local policies and practice that influence um, role preferences or um, influence how people's role preferences are formed. So for example, if you're working in a, a clinician working in a hospital where decision aids are sort of routinely built into clinical care, for example, you might be more likely to offer a more shared care um, approach. Um, and I think um, Sam has mentioned some really nice examples of where, you know, society and culture might influence people's expectations. And certainly I had experience of a healthcare system where there was, a, as I said, a strong medical model. And I think patients and clinicians there were just much less likely to expect opportunities um, for shared decision-making within their care. 
So I mentioned this briefly before, but there's some evidence that people have different role preferences for different types of medical decisions. So um, active roles are preferred for minor illnesses or behavioural choices like quitting smoking. Um, and these can change, as we heard from Semra, over the disease uh, trajectory, which is you know, consistent with patient characteristics such as having an experience of an illness, making you more likely to want an active role in decision making. Um, and also just to flag, again, um, it's been mentioned before, but you know, not all clinical decisions are preference sensitive or appropriate for shared care. Um, so there's certainly some clinical context that, that um, influences some of this. And finally, um, there's the idea that medical decision making isn't just a single decision that gets made uh, in a, an instant. It's made up of sort of a number of different activities. So I've characterised it here as seeking information, discussing, discussing options and making decisions. Semra had four steps. Um, people like Deba have two steps of problem solving and choosing. I think whichever way you sort of break it up, um, the literature generally seems to suggest that patients like want to receive information um, they like to be asked their opinion and be involved in the discussion but often that making of a final decision is something that they um, would like or prefer to delegate their decisions to their um, physicians so that's i guess my thinking around what role preferences are and how they're formed and influenced um, and i think it is really interesting to think about how this might influence health preferences research. And you know, I, I can think of examples where any of those um, things any of us have talked about might influence um, you know, someone doing, for example, a discrete choice experiment. Um, I guess these were the things that just quickly came to mind. So probably most obvious is that people who have a role preference for doctor directed care might find it difficult to participate in a choice survey that asks them to make decisions about their care, which is certainly the experience I had. Um, there's also the factor that, you know, the same patient and context factors that influence people's role preferences are likely to influence their healthcare preferences and probably how they complete a choice survey as well. I don't know that this is necessarily a problem, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, in terms of decision-making activity, I guess I hadn't previously thought about it, but a choice experiment probably only captures that final decision-making component rather than the other activities around seeking information and discussing options. And I guess there could be things that happen in that process that might change um, a patient's final decision and we, we might not capture that. So they might think that they're giving us their preference, but actually other factors might have influenced them um, if they were facing that choice in real life. Um, and then I guess that's sort of a type of hypothetical bias. And I think that's similar nice. to that, a lot of those people who we would see involved in a decision um, that we've talked about, you know, patients and clinicians aren't obviously involved in a DCE or a, in a health preferences research study. And so you're sort of missing their role um, in decision making. Well, um, fantastic. I did have oh, go yeah, ahead. one other go slide, which was just, oh, no, actually, I, I did have one other slide, but I think I'm going to skip it just because I'd rather hear everyone else's um, ideas for how we can manage that rather than my last minute. Uh uh, my head is spinning, to be honest, after all three of your presentations. And instead of having you guys chime in on each other, because I know that you guys will chime in on the questions, and we have a lineup of 11 questions already. So I'm going to switch us as moderator. I'm Benjamin Craig. Um, I'm Associate Professor of Economics at the University of South Florida and Executive Director of the International Academy of Health Preference Research. If you like this, contact me, I've sent my contact information and you would be welcome to join our future webinars uh, for the Academy, but I really appreciate the um, Health Preference Research SIG with Fern, Jason and Matthew uh, for organizing this one. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to our first question asker, Michelle Evans, but um, I'm just gonna chime in after Michelle's done and, and, the, and it, there was a response to name the next person and then keep on going through the list. Rapid fire, rapid fire for the panel, okay? In other words, questions, keep them short, answers, keep them short, just so we can get everyone's questions in and there will be more. Michelle, to you. Um, good evening, I'm going from Australia. It's about half past 10 at night over here. Janine, this is a question about your framework and it's really just the clarification. I'm not sure if somebody can bring it up on, on the screen 
really quickly. Um, but what I wasn't sure that um, in the, the outer, um, that's it in the, the decision characteristics, the disease characteristics and the external environment, it looks like they're on the patient side only. And I'm just wondering if they also belong on the clinician side of the framework as well, and just the way that it's, um, it's written, um, or if I'm wrong completely. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? My, uh, I didn't know whether I'd unmuted myself and I have now shared but lost my mute button. Yes, I, I definitely uh, think the decision characteristics, if you, if you look at the, at the level, I've um, <laughs> put a, uh, I don't know what it's called now, but the stripe here. So this one is separated, but the decision characteristics, characteristics disease characteristics and external factors actually run through to the other side as well. So they are also uh, related to the clinician and the role and treatment preference of the clinician. Thank Does you. that just answer your question? For, um, for ease of reading for other people, that it might be useful to replicate it on both sides. That's, that's all. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so for that feedback, yeah. Now we're heading over to Juan Marcos Gonzalez and uh, Duke University. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentations. They were so, so, so good, really. Worth waking up, you know, really early for it. Um, quick questions. So here, actually, um, I did have a question also about the rings and specifically whether uh, there was an implicit hierarchy here uh, in terms of the relative impact of each of these areas. And I am only asking this because it does remind me a little bit of um, the sort of the infamous Becker household decision-making model, right? Where, where there might be useful information in understanding the power dynamics here between these, these different aspects, right? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I actually don't know the answer to the question. I, I realized that with, within putting in the circles, I was suggesting a hierarchy. Um, for some factors, I think I, th I could think of examples where there might be, but there, I, I could also think of examples where actually um, decision characteristics or disease characteristics might be more important than family factors. So um, I think it really depends again on the characteristics, what the hierarchy would be. And, and it's not so much um, that this is always the case in every decision this order. Good. Was that Thank you. Clarify? Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's, that's helpful to understand. Um, um, should I just let the other person? <laughs> Susanna <laughs> from University of South Florida. What's your question? Hi, um, I'm glad that I wake up early today uh, to hear these presentations because uh, it's really interesting and I found them very fascinating. Um, so I am uh, I'm a PhD student in the University of South Florida. So it, for me, it's more of like an observation because I also came from a very third world country like from Bangladesh where they, have, they don't have any, like uh, in the health system, we don't have any um, proper setup of a health insurance. So everything is, all the medical treatment is coming from out of pocket. And I found that like, uh, it's just from my personal experience that the role preference would be much higher when there is a financial, um, when the financial uh, burden is coming from the stakeholders and they are the one, then they will make the decisions uh, at a very like in a hierarchical level rather than from any other concept. So I'm just wondering like how to put that into the framework or whether like it depends on a very like a particular health system. I would consider that a health system factor and put it in the external uh, factors. I'm, I'm, I'm too lucky to be living in a country where this is not an, an issue. So I would gladly, um, I saw Samra raising her hand. Yes. I think she can say much smarter things about this than me. Um, um, yeah, I don't mind taking this question. Um, so yeah, I mean, Singapore, it's a high income country. We have a great healthcare system and, um, uh, and there are two kind of, um, the way the government sees the healthcare system here is um, in two ways. Where one is uh, basic healthcare is should be accessible to everybody, but also payers are you know users of the healthcare system are responsible for their own um, treatments basically. So in that sense, there is a huge amount of out of pocket costs associated with um, 
um, medical treatments. And um, and we definitely see this, you know, financial dependency to the family makes such a big difference in terms of their involvement in the decision making, especially when you look at, you know, I mentioned about how caregivers are influential and within the caregivers, um, you know, the, the support person, the one who's involved in most, usually the one who kind of holds the budget, you know, holds the mm -hmm. purse, basically. Yeah, we're definitely seeing that. Another thing, this is related to Juan Marcos's uh, question. Um, he, in the chat box, he had a question about how does the healthcare system, you know, plays in uh, what kind of role or factor they play in, in role preferences. And I must say it does. And finances is a very good way to explain this. In Singapore, it has a very unique system of uh, people can, there is something called MediSay where you, it's compulsory to put some money for your healthcare expenses. Like every citizen has to do this. And the in unique part of it is that you can use your MediSave or your family members MediSave to pay your medical expenses. So that is also, I think, one of the things that really motivates in Singapore involvement of the caregivers and the family because, you know, it's not just their, the, the patient's income, but it's also the family, uh, family caregiver's income or their savings at stake um, in medical decisions. Okay, I'm going to take moderator privilege to follow up on that one because okay. I think you're asking two separate questions. Questions. One question is who gets the treatment preference, but how much does the payer get to participate? Because the payer also has to decide to allocate the family funds towards that treatment. So while a person may say, um, you know, if you're going to use family funds, it may be kind of a hierarchical process then. While you want this treatment, you may have to go to the head of household and say, I need these funds in order to pay for this treatment. Is that what you're saying, Samra? Yes, more or less. I mean, uh, sometimes it may not be what you prefer, but you end up doing it because you kind of have to. <laughs> so there's, you know, preferences. Yeah, you know, your, your preferred role is not because you wish, but because of other reasons, yeah. Very good, very good. Um, uh, Mogira, I haven't heard a response from you. Can you chime in? Okay. Um, if not, we're gonna go to uh, Chuan Zi. Okay. If not, no, no, can you? No, oh, Mugira, Mugira. There you are. There you are. <laughs> Mugira, yes. great, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for the interesting topic. And thank you for all the presenters. Ferris. Uh, yes, I missed the something that I think is very, very important, uh, which is the, the third buyer or the, the, the health insurance. Exactly. Uh, it may be mentioned. Uh, implicitly in, in, in some presentation, but not explicitly. I think it is important because a health insurance corporation or health insurance plan play a great role in configuring the role preferences by its influences in the level of healthcare services given to the patient, which in turn dependent on the type of plan that the patient is in. For example, some services are exempted from the uh, health insurance. Sometimes some uh, health insurance uh, services, uh, some services are including within the package that is uh, offered to the patient. Sometimes they are not, or the level is less. Or some hospitals, sometimes some hospitals are contracted with the health insurance institutions that I have uh, health insurance with. Sometimes, so they may play a greater role in shaping the preferences. Uh, but I really, I missed in all the presentation explicitly, not implicitly. They may be in the environment, they may be in the uh, policy or in the... Uh, thank you. This for all the present. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to take that? System shaping preferences. I, I mean, I think we've, we've had a discussion about... Um, the, the role of financial, you know, who's paying for things, potentially having an impact on role preferences. I think you can just tell that Janine and I come from universal healthcare systems, so it just never crossed our mind to put that in the model. And maybe we should just take that, uh, uh, that, uh, that sort of comment um, and question on notice and, and go back and do some more thinking about how that might 
sort of fit in within our models or what we might need to tweak. I think I implicitly um, put it in external environment, but, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I, I did not consider give, coming from a very privileged healthcare system. I think I, I didn't realize the impact it could have. So thank you for that for that comment, and I think we'll we'll definitely thank include you. it in the in the framework yeah. somehow. Okay, yeah. so, and so more moving explicit. In Moving on to Chuanzi. Hi everyone, thank you. Um, thank you for um, for the great presentation. I just um, yeah, um, I just got a question regarding how how could the utility kind of model in terms of kind of like a review preference be identified if we follow the sort of um, role preference and medical preference framework. So just imagine if we like let's say if we have a discrete choice model and then and where the consumer just choose the, uh, the one medication with the highest utility. And, uh, and I will regard, let's say, the role preference as a weight that put to the uh, utility. And then the, the doctor's decision will be something, let's say, uh, an additional term added after that utility. So, the, so how these framework be ever be just kind of be, be kind of identified. Um, Thank, oh, thank those are fighting words. How are you going to identify this econometrically, my my panelists? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just just based on my kind of backgrounds. So, uh, yeah, I'm kind of interesting. I'm kind of new to all this. Sorry if that's a too stupid question. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I. I just don't have a, an economic background myself. It, it is, I mean, the utility function itself, it's something I'm, I'm, I've learned about, but I'm struggling with. So I can't answer your question. Um, I, I think in terms of our paper, which we envisage statistical analysis will be, uh, will be a part of it and, and a part where we definitely need somebody with more experience than me to, um, to develop that part. So, uh, Happy to have you join to give us your input on, on that section, I think. <laughs> okay. Samra, do you have an answer for him? Um, I don't have an answer, but I have an answer, yes. <laughs> um, so I think, the, first of all, you know, I think your also question starts with, you know, is are these different frameworks, role preference and medical preference frameworks? Uh, and I believe I... I think they are different frameworks and different decisions, at least. But you know, utility function is very flexible, and I, uh, although I'm terrible at econometrics, uh, I'm sure you can use utility functions to define preferences for roles in decision making, as we define for the um, for the treatments or medical decisions in general. However, having said that, I think um, there is also the case that preferences in role, uh, uh, role preferences may affect preferences for medica medications or care pathways as well. I think there's definitely a connection there as well. Right. So without giving you a I, utility function, that's my kind of overall and, approach. And Anna asked a very similar question, but I don't know if her question has shifted since. Anna? No, thank you very much, Benjamin. And thank you very much to the panelists. This is a very interesting webinar. I really find it fascinating. What my question was that I'm wondering if age and gender, if any of you have looked at that in the roles, I would see here in the West of Ireland, sometimes if I look at the previous generation, even to me, they would not question a doctor at all, where they would totally be led by the doctor and the priest and the teachers were the educated people in the rural communities. And you certainly wouldn't question maybe any of those, <laughs> any of those. So uh, our gender, if that's something you have looked at. I actually did and definitely consistently what we are finding is that older individuals are less likely to involve or the level of involvement from older individuals are 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 lower uh, because I kind of um, 
uh, younger people uh, are more likely to take the higher levels of involvement in decision making process. And in terms of gender, what I have seen in the literature, gender uh, evidence on gender is very mixed. Uh, some studies show females, some studies males to be more um, involved in decision making. However, consistently in my studies in Asia, I'm finding that males are more likely to involved uh, actively in decision making compared to females. And this can again be, you know, explained by the uh, kind of patriarchal households in, in the Asian context where males in general make the decisions. And I have seen, um, uh, like, I, I, I kind of, I like shadowing clinicians and kind of just sit in their, you know, uh, um, consultations. And I can never remember in one setting where the uh, the, the 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 head of the family just ignored the um, ignored the, his wife and only talked about how his disease, the fact that he's gonna die because this was a palliative care patient, um, is gonna affect his son, and it was all about that um, and how his son, you know, involves in the decision making or him involved. Like it was just that 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 like you know the, the wife didn't exist as if it was so eye opening for me. Um, so yes, definitely different groups. Um, again, one of the things we're seeing is minorities um, in different cultures. Uh, again, they are less likely to be involved in the decision making. That's another thing I have been seeing very consistently. Thank you. And it's, it's very interesting because I have that one reference from a systematic review that, that include, uh, concludes that, that age definitely plays a role with older people, people being more in, less involved, preferring a, a passive role. Uh, and that review concludes that, that males take a more active role than females. In my experience, my personal experience within my studies, it's, it's the other way around. It's, it's the females in the Netherlands taking the more active role in decision-making even for their partners. So in their own case, but also in decisions that, that affect their partners. And on the other side, the physicians, I have the experiences, but it could be totally related to the, to the work field that female physicians are more likely to share a role with their patients than the, the male physicians. But then in the Netherlands, there's also a very, uh, there's an overrepresentation of females in the more GP child um, uh, uh, um, role, uh, the, the jobs than, the, than, for instance, the orthopedics and the brain. I saw the mention of the orthopedics and the brain surgeons. Those are mostly males in the Netherlands. So there's a, there's a difficult interaction there. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. My, my mom is a very active patient, and uh, I can tell you that. So she she break that general rule. Uh, but uh, Mutsa, you you are next. Uh, um, if you could unmute. Yes. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so my question just was about the influence of, um, I guess, social media and media, just in what we've already witnessed uh, now, I guess, just with the vaccination. So I was just wondering how you'll, I guess, incorporate that, because not only does it influence patients, but it also influences clinicians, as we've seen. So I guess it's just in this era of misinformation we're living in, how are we going to accommodate that? Alison, yeah, you're unmuted. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And I think, um, you know, when I started my other people section of my model, it just had the patient and the clinician and the family. And then I was like, oh, and the multidisciplinary teams. And then um, Tao uh, in the comments has added in that people go shopping for different, well, not shopping, but they go to different doctors for opinions. So I've just, you know, got to add that to another box. And I did end up talking about policy and society and and culture and, and these um sorts of broader influences that I think you're right influence the patient and the clinician and and what expectations they have of each other as well as of themselves um I mean I hadn't specifically included sort of social media as a specific influence but certainly within that idea of society I would include those kind of um as you say influences um because they they certainly you know we know that they can have an impact um on people's healthcare preferences. And so it would follow that they probably have an impact on moral preferences as well. Very good. So now we're on to Angeline. Angeline, can you unmute? Hello. There you are. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very much. 
I'm Angeline Dobe, and I'm very happy to participate in this webinar. I'm an assistant professor in economics at the University Félix Fouet Boigny of Abidjan in Côte d'Ivoire. And um, my research area is uh, health uh, financing, but I'm also interested by research in health preference decision making. Uh, I will try to speak in English. <laughs> my question is the following. Does the patient experience with a doctor uh, habit to saying the doctor affect their willingness to participate in decision making? Thank you. Um. I Go already ahead, turned Sarah. on the air. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Go not ahead. very interested in English, but uh, uh, I'm coming from a French-speaking country, mm. and I try to to speak in English. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Thank Angeline, you. you were you were very clear. Thank you very much for your for your question. It was a very clear question, and um, uh, definitely. I, I have not myself looked at this, but however, there is evidence from the literature that shows that um, how much like the kind of communication, um, uh, the quality of the communication patient has with their physician, the kind of interaction they have with the physician, um, how much they trust their uh, physician, the, those um, factors influence um, patients' involvement in decision making. Yes. Very you. good. Yeah, and I would like to add to that. I've, I've left it out because of time, but I think there's a great paper that discusses a learning loop model of collaborative decision making in chronic illness that, that discuss, discusses this, the, the role of trust in the physician, the relationship you have with your physician, but also the duration of that relationship in regard to your preference to be involved for decision with, in decisions. Okay, thank you. Very good. Tara. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Good morning. Uh, my question is to Alison, um, um, because you were mentioning that when you were doing the DCE, uh, some of the participants refused to take part because they were putting all their trust in the doctor. And I've seen in the literature that sometimes that is actually included as an attribute. Sometimes they define it as, oh, this treatment is highly recommended, strongly recommended, some, some sort of wording levels like that. Um, uh, do you think that's useful? So in that way, it's also the role preferences is included in the treatment preference when the patient chooses treatment A or treatment B in the DCE. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, we tried that. <laughs> we had it right at the top. You know, the doctor recommends both of these options strongly, and um, but both of them are equally effective, and the doctor wants you to make this decision for yourself. And the doctor doesn't mind which one you do and won't be offended. You know, all these different things. We just we couldn't get them to choose. Um, but you know, I think that that might have been a, a particular example, and I think in general. Um, that idea of putting some information like that into the scenario might be helpful. So I think there's probably, um, as, a, as a result of putting together that diagram, there's probably some things which I wouldn't normally consider putting into a, a scenario for a DCE that maybe I would think of now around the process that had been undertaken to get the patient to the point of having to make this choice. So um, trying, I guess, to give them a bit more description about what other information they might have processed or um, who might have been involved and that sort of thing um, to try and give them a bit more context and make the decisions seem a bit more realistic or at least reflect a little bit more, you know, the likely reality of if they were facing this decision um, in real life. Um, yeah, so I think doing something like saying the doctor recommends is a really good idea, but, you know, I just can't recommend pre-testing highly enough to make sure that you're, you know, that that is actually helping. Formative qualitative research, always good. All right, Ingrid. 
Um, thanks. Thanks for a great webinar. I think my question is very similar to some that have come before. Um, and, and so I think that the answers are emerging. Um, I directed my question at Allison, but it's really for all the panelists. Do you have any suggestions for how we could incorporate role preferences um, and their, the influence of the other role players in patient decision making in how we conduct or interpret DCEs um, so that our stated preferences that we get from the DCE are more aligned with the revealed preferences? Um, this really follows on from the previous one. And, and it sounds like you know what I'm hearing is qualitative research. Consider building it into your DCE. Do you have any other? other uh, suggestions? Um, yeah, I mean, I one of the ideas I had was collecting role preferences probably quite early in the survey so that you could tell whether people who dropped out were dropping out because they didn't think this was a decision they should be making. Um, whereas normally I would include that kind of question at the end, you know, where I collect health literacy and sociodemographics. Um, I did also have a crazy idea that maybe you could collect that information and then pipe them through the survey so that people who wanted to have a really collaborative um, approach to decision making got lots of information about how they'd had this consultation with the doctor and the doctor had given them this information and then they'd gone and talked to this other person who'd given them more information and you know whereas people who wanted a doctor directed decision would just be told the doctors decided that these are the two options and you have to choose between them or something like that to try and make the the discrete choice that the you know the, the choice within the experiment more reflective of kind of the pathway they would get to it in clinical practice I don't know if that's very realistic <laughs> but um, I think there's probably the other option I had was to have a you know if you've got a clinical opt-out to also have a I don't want to make this choice opt-out which you would then I guess analyze differently um, I didn't really think through all the implications of that, but what, that was the only other kind of crazy idea I had for how you could incorporate this into a DCE. Option I, I, oh, go ahead, Jenny. Yeah, just, just I would second all those options and I thought about them myself as well. The, another thing I, I saw, but haven't done myself, is actually including role preference as a, an attribute in the DCE itself. I, I don't know whether I would recommend it, but it's, it's something, if your formative research tells you that there's actually a trade-off between role preferences and characteristics, characteristics of the treatment might be something to consider. Very good. So after 65 attendees and over, gosh, uh, over a dozen questions, one last question from Charles, then we'll go to Janine for a description of her project, and then Fern will conclude. Hi, Charles? Um, hey. Um really not sure how to ask this question, but uh, in the whole discussion just occurred to me that uh, there may be a space for preference diagnosis. So we diagnose the preferences before we get into thinking about shared decision making and, and wondered if any of the panelists has any thoughts about how do we diagnose preferences and therefore walk into this whole process, this is shared decision making with uh, less of assumptions uh, and, and more of uh, uh, information that uh, would lead us to really getting to shared decision making as opposed to any other way of, uh, of, of decision making. Preference diagnostics. Are we talking about preferences for treatments or are we talking about preferences for roles in decision making? That's why I said I'm not really <laughs> how to ask this question. I think both. Um, I think both. So, um, so um, I'm going to focus on the roles in um, uh, preferences for roles in decision making since um, we are focusing on that in this panel. And um, there are some tools in diagnostics um, or scales that's been used and Janine and I think Ellison gave some examples of those tools. And my personal opinion is that I'm not satisfied with them because of their dietic approach to and focusing on 
um, patient and clinician relationship, excluding family caregivers or, or you know, general loved ones, basically. Um, so, um, so I think there's definitely room to develop better tools. Uh, also tools, as I mentioned in my, at the end of my presentation, tools to get at different stages of the decision-making process. But this, yeah, that's my, my point of view. Yeah, I think uh, what you inherently said is that um, we're interested in not only understanding the patient's role preferences, but to understand the context, like how many stakeholders are involved has to be understood first before you figure out whose role preferences actually yes. you should yes. start with. Yes, definitely. And in clinician, you know, this, this happens in the clinic, actually, you know, clinicians, especially here in Singapore, they have to first understand who's who are the stakeholders, that's where they start from. And that's why, you know, they don't explicitly understand that they're doing it sometimes, but when they describe what happens, and that's what they're doing, actually, without even noticing, because there's so many family members in the room. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Janine, why don't you talk about your project, and then Svern concludes. Yes, Ben, thank you. Yes, well, this whole endeavor is part of a project I uh, initiated to study this relationship between role preferences, three pre prefer preferences, and the relationship to, to informing medical decisions. Uh, we are uh, currently in the process of writing uh, a paper on this. Uh, we have a core team of people who have expressed interest uh, to participate in that, but we're still open to new people joining our team. Uh, the aim would be really to, well, first we will develop this framework and then in the paper we will discuss how this framework will um, impact formative research, how to measure role preferences along preference elicitation tasks, and how to describe role preferences uh, within the descriptive framework or within the task itself. So if you are interested to hearing more about this project or joining the project either as an active collaborator or somebody who would be willing to read the paper once it's in a in one of its final stages uh, please drop me an email i will just put my email in the comments because i forgot to make it part of the presentation so and the recording of this will be available fern would you conclude Oh, you're muted, Fern. <laughs> thanks so much. And um, thanks, Janine, Samra, and Alison um, for your great presentations. And I also wanted to thank Ben for organizing. Um, it was uh, Ben, I also have to recognize that he was also uh, quite fun, um, a mover and shaker in terms of supporting getting the, the request in for the special interest group via IHEA. Um, and um, on a lot of collaboration between the Hia SIG and the I IAPRA or IHPR. So um, just to say that it was really nice to be able to bring these two worlds together in this, um, in this session. Um, thanks to all the great, participa great participation. I was really, really very proud to see people from all over the globe joining, even if it wasn't your first language. Um, being participating. So I'm really, it always makes me very happy. Um, and, and I think it's really critical that we're all participating as well, rather than only talking about patients' participation. I just wanted to mention, if you're working on a DCE that you'd like to have feedback on, um, if you're a PhD student, early career re researcher, or a more mature researcher, we're very happy to have you presenting in the IHEA SIG, or again, we could do another joint uh, seminar. Uh, we have the uh, coordinators, conveners email addresses for the IHEA health preference research, and as well as the uh, email address for the International Academy for Health Preference Research. So we thank you all for joining. The uh, recording will be posted up on the IHEA website for access for non-IHEA members. Because I think what I saw is a lot of new faces. So I think uh, it went out beyond the I I hear, um, uh membership. Maybe Dai, are you on to to help us know if non I hear members will still be able to access that or not? I'm going to stop sharing and thank everyone. Absolutely, it will be posted on the public part of the I hear website.
it might take a few days, but if you just have a look for um, past webinars, it, it will be there. And it also, we provide a link under each of the specific SIGs. So if you go to the health preference SIG, you should have a link through to it from, from there. Thank you so much, but Just Di. from my side, to thank everyone for organizing this and for participating, I thought it was really incredibly interesting. And it's exactly the sort of thing that, that I hear is, is wanting to promote is engagement and also a little bit of debate about um, concepts and um, methodologies. And I, I think that this was really outstanding from, from that perspective. Thanks very much to everyone. Great job, panelists. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Have a great week, guys. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.